all. I'm very excited about our second annual webinar, um, Financial Literacy Week. So we're excited. We have two great speakers on tonight and I will introduce them later. But before we get started, I want to um, share a video to give you some history about um, the North Carolina Negro Women's Council for our visitors and to remind those of us who are members how blessed we are to be a part of this prestigious organization. Um, Sister Margie, can you play the video for me? Yes, good evening. Um, again, uh, as I said, we're glad that um, you are here. We will give you a little history about the National Council of Negro Women and also Alamance Gifford section. I'll make sure that we are able to um, hear it as well, so. In these times, we feel that in order to achieve the goal of civil and human rights for all, it is necessary for women of all races and creeds to know and understand each other. The National Council of Negro Women Incorporated was created and led by a woman of immense vision far beyond the understanding of the times. Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune knew what a powerful force women of color could be if we were organized and focused. Having been involved with many established organizations, such as the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the United Negro College Fund, Jack and Jill of America, and the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. She knew it could be done. Not to mention creating a school from a one-room building outside of Daytona, which was called Bethune-Cookman College and is now a university. While all of these individual organizations were moving in a positive direction, she envisioned something greater. Thus, in 1935, the National Council of Negro Women was born an organization of organizations. By 1938, NCNW coordinated regular visits to the White House to bring attention to the need for more black female administrators in the U.S. government and the organization was involved in the formation of the Women's Army Corps that led to the desegregation of the military. In the 1940s and 50s, the organization was led by Dorothy Bolden Ferebe, an obstetrician and a civil rights activist, and Vivian Carter Mason, a city administrator devoted to social and political reform. Mrs. Ferebe and Mrs. Mason overcame the obstacles, and under their leadership, NCNW lobbied for women's rights. They fought racial discrimination and established a national health care system. Sometimes a leader will arrive who will forever change an organization. Dr. Dorothy Irene Height was that leader. She was chosen to lead the organization in 1957. While being one of the major architects of the civil rights movement, she achieved nonprofit status for NCNW and shifted our focus to advancing our standard of living. As the godmother of the civil rights movement, she stated, empowerment is the most important thing we can give ourselves. Change comes not at the direction of a nation, but at the insistence of its people. It was her vision to purchase the building at 633 Pennsylvania Avenue as the new home for NCNW. And in the year 1996, that objective came to fruition. We came to love her stories, and we loved her smile. We loved those hats that she wore like a crown, regal. Following the passing of Dr. Dorothy Height in 2010, former teacher, news producer, and prison administrator, Dr. Barbara Shaw, 
stepped up to be the national chair. Her quest was to keep NCNW moving forward. And through her steady leadership and tenacity, we did just that during a critical time. In 2012, Ingrid Saunders Jones was unanimously elected to be the sixth NCNW national chair. She stepped into the NCNW leadership role and successfully steered the organization to firm financial footing with an emphasis on future growth. Ms. Jones' mantra, NCNW is alive and well and solvent, became a rallying call, along with her passion to build a stronger black America. And it was evident in NCNW's direction. Four for the future, focused on education through STEM, health disparities in communities with HIV and AIDS, financial literacy for entrepreneurship, and public policy through public engagement. When Dr. Janetta Besh Cole was unanimously elected the seventh president and national chair one year ago, she challenged the organization to meet two specific goals. This organization is poised to be more intergenerational and to be more prominent nationally and ultimately internationally. Having presided over the only two colleges for women of color in the U.S., Spelman and Bennett, Dr. Cole understands that to reach its full potential, NCNW must have deep roots as well as emboldened wings. You need to look back in order to go forward. The folk who grew me up said, you can't know where you're going if you don't know where you've been. Dr. Cole is responsible for launching Girl Tech, a symposium for women in technology that reaches across the country in order to share ideas, mentor one another, and network within the industry. The inaugural year of the HBCU tour has sparked interest in over 3,000 high school students and is already in the planning stages to overshadow this year's efforts. I might be able in this period, working with others, to bring NCNW more prominently back on the national scene. There should never be a convening around a table. Certainly having anything to do with black women where NCNW does not have a seat. Wow, that was powerful. I enjoy seeing that every time. I, and I thoroughly enjoyed the quote, empowerment is the most important thing we can give ourselves. And that's why we're here tonight. Yeah, the rest of this is Mathis, and I am the executive director of the National Council of Negro Women. Is that it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And this is the reason why we're here on this week uh, to be empowered with all the vital information that's going to be shared. And I want to start off by giving you the bio of our two facilitators on tonight. Our first facilitator will be Lystra John. Um, Lystra is the first generation born to immigrant parents in Brooklyn, New York. Lystra was introduced to finances at the tender age of 16 by way of program in her high school, which landed her a job on Wall Street. At the age of 18, Lister encountered her first year not filling taxes and was not happy with the results. That experience led her to start doing her own taxes and then friends and family. The more she did taxes, the more she learned and the more she became passionate about the industry. With more than 20 years as a tax preparer, she realized that her peers had a fear of taxes and the IRS. 
that led her to want to educate and help remove the overwhelming stigma of that fear. Listra is an E5 processor with the IRS and recently became certified by the IRS and is listed on the IRS website. She, is, she recently expanded her tax businesses nationwide, which include New York, Maryland, North Carolina, and Alabama. Listra, we welcome you on tonight. Our second facilitator is Carmen Palmer. I am so proud to be able to introduce Carmen. She is my realtor and my friend and my sister. Um, Carmen was born and raised in Eden, North Carolina before becoming a resident of Winston-Salem in 2003. She is married to Keith Palmer and a proud mother of three beautiful, talented children, Jalen, Sierra, and Carrington. She is also uh, professionally, she has been in sales for over 21 years and previously held professional licenses in life and health, health insurances before being licensed in the real estate through the North, the, through the state of North Carolina in 2016, 2006, I'm sorry. Um, she's a top sales associate for 20, uh, Century 21 and Coldware Banker until 2013. Carmen stepped out on her faith and opened up her own real estate firm, Master Key Realty, a multi-million dollar producing full service real estate brokerage firm located in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. She has been recognized by her peers and colleagues by numerous accomplishments and awards in the real estate industry. In 2018, Carmen and her husband Keith purchased Remax franchise becoming the first African-American Remax franchise owned in the triad. For the last two years, Carmen has been awarded TGE Executive Club by Remax Corporation for her sales volume. She's actively involved in her community. She empowers others to actively serve and engage in their community by volunteering. Over the years, Carmen has set up distribution sites for food, water, and clothing, clothing to help those in need throughout Forsyth and Rockingham County. Carmen is the vice president of the board of directors for Forsyth Academy Charter School, Winston-Salem Association of Realtors Community Services Board of Member, committed member for leadership Winston-Salem Open and Retreat, active volunteer for the Ronald McDonald's House board member for the Black Alumni Association of Rockingham County. As you can see, she's a talented and busy person. So Carmen, we welcome you as well. We thank you both. At this time, I'm gonna go ahead on and turn it over to Sister Listra so she can take us further. Mm -hmm. If you have questions as our facilitators go along through their presentation, please use the chat feature to um, pose your questions and we will make sure your questions are answered at the end of her presentation. Listra. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And welcome to everyone. Um, I am totally excited and honored to present tonight um, for such an amazing organization. I'm honored that you guys invited me and I am honored that I'm able to educate my peers um, especially sisters um, with the information that I have to share. I won't hold you guys for long, but I get excited and I'm very passionate about taxes, something that a lot of people don't like to talk about. So I have a couple of notes here. I try not to read too much. I go off the head. So if I'm going too long, ladies, please um, let me know that I need to chill out because <laughs> I'm passionate about this thing. So um, like she said, I've been doing taxes since I was 18 years old, um, over 20 years in the industry. And I realized that it's a topic that is only discussed certain times. There are only certain industries, certain times when individuals want to talk about taxes. And taxes are like fingerprints. Everyone's situation is unique. All right. There's no two people that have the same. They can make the same amount of money, live in the same state, have the same amount of children, but these tax numbers just aren't the same. So 
as a result of that, it's very, um, it's a unique industry, it's a unique situation, and people usually only want to talk about taxes when they owe taxes, when they're facing an IRS audit, if they have a tax lien, or when they're ready to purchase a home. Those are the situations when you hear people really get focused about their taxes. However, um, in 2020 and 21, we had a unique situation. Um, we, we were faced with a pandemic. We were faced with a lot of people working from home and the government made a lot of changes. And a lot, one of those changes was a lot of people were um, starting to receive stimulus checks and they were determined by an individual's taxes. That's when I seen the increase. Um, I, I apologize y'all, my son is using the um, air fryer. <laughs> um, that's when there was an increase in interest and conversation about taxes. Um, why do we always have to wait until a, situa a situation or crisis comes to discuss something that we have to deal with every day? All right. So um, what happens is there's two set of tax law. There's two, two sets. There's one for the individual. And there's one for the person that has a business owner. All right, that's it. Now you can fall into both categories and I'll tell you briefly the difference between the two. And this is what intrigued me. This is why I got involved with taxes when I was 18. I didn't understand when I had a job, there was, um, you know, It'll say gross and net. And then there was a little thing underneath that said FICA. And I asked my mother who was FICA because I didn't understand why she had her hands in my pocket. And she was getting money before I was getting money. That's what separates the W-2 earner from the business owner. Their taxes is taken as soon as they make it. When you get your paycheck, they take it out immediately. You have federal and FICA. Um, and, and Medicaid and Medicare and all of that. They get their money first dibs off the top. Business owners, on the other hand, they pay their taxes after. So they get all their money up front and then they pay their taxes. There's two set of tax laws. There's, um, and that's really what all the hoopla and everything is about. Um, you guys may be hearing different, uh, I call it the, the IRS ABCs, the PPPs and the SBAs and the IEDLs and the FICAs. It's a lot of letters, but they all are important to, every, to each individual, all right? So last year I noticed that a lot of individuals just didn't, it was fear and also just misunderstanding, lack of knowledge. So I changed the way I do things and I do everything in my power to educate my peers, share as much knowledge. And I'm glad that I'm invited tonight to share some things with you guys, just so that um, taxes is not a foreign conversation. All right. So I'm going to share five things with you guys that every individual should know about their tax situation. I'm going to ask you guys to get pen and paper and please take copious notes. It's easy to hear things and um, it goes in one ear and come out the other. However, when you write things down, it registers. I, I do that in church. I do that in school. I just believe in taking it copious notes. All right. So we're going to start with one of the first things that I want you guys to know. All right. Let me get my, make sure I got all my notes together. The first thing you need to know is what is your tax bracket? Okay. And you can go on the irs.gov, not .com, dot, .com website, and you can look and they have the information. Basically, based on the money that you earn, it will tell you how much of that money goes to taxes. Once you know your tax bracket, you can act accordingly. Because if they're telling you that for the first 10,000, 10% of your money goes to taxes, you know that you need to put that amount up. Whether you get it taken out of your paycheck or whether you own a business and you have to pay that after, all right? So it's very important for an individual, for people, for people to know what their tax bracket is. 
And people, it's, it's, I ask people all the time and they do not know. I think as a people, we need to stop saying I'm poor with poverty. No, you need to know what exact tax bracket you fit into. All right. So that, that's, that's number one. Number two is you want to make sure that if you work a job that your W-4 is up to date. There's individuals that work at jobs um, for years, filled out that W-4 at the interview process, really don't remember what they put on the W-4, don't understand what the questions mean. And as a result, they're getting not enough taxes taken out or too much taxes taken out. So it's important to understand what the W-4 process is, what, it, what the W-4 form is, and if it's wrong, find out how it can be updated. If you work at a job, it can be done at your human resources. You can also go to the irs.gov website. They have simplified it. They ask a couple of questions and you can actually enter that information in. They'll ask you um, how many kids you have, how many dependents, do you have another job? Do you have a side business? And then it'll recommend how much, how much dependents they, they um they recommend that you put on your taxes. So that is number two, something that I see get messed up all the time with individuals and they don't recognize it until it's too late, all right? So it's, it's important to identify those things. Um, let's see what else I have here. It's important to, 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 um, to know so I went over, it's important to know whether your, um, how much taxes is getting taken out of your check. It's important to know what is your, um, your filing status. Are you single? Are you married filing joint? Are you my married filing separately? Are you a widow? Are you the head of household? Different filing status determine how your taxes, the outcome of your tax return. And there are individuals that are not filing their taxes correctly because they are using the wrong filing status on DIY um, income tax preparation sites. For instance, um, there are individuals that are married per se, and um, they've been separated for years and they're filing their taxes, um, married filing separately. And that's actually the, that's the, the, um, the filing status that gets the least amounts of credit. So you want to make sure that you're filing your taxes. If you're not using a tax professional and you're, you're doing it DIY, that you know your filing status. Are you head of household? What qualifies as head of household? Are you a widower? Last year, we had a lot of people, thousands and thousands of people that lost um, individuals and their family due to COVID. Well, how do you file your taxes when you have a deceased person in your life? A lot of people think they don't have to file that deceased person. Um, what do you do? How is it done? So these are questions that, these, this is information that an individual should know and that it, it helps determine the outcome of your tax return, all right? And then you want to know if you have a business, how much money should you be putting up? Should you put up 10%, 20%, 30%? Um, should you pay it quarterly? Should you pay it at the end of the year? Should you pay it in April? Um, should you pay it in January? So what I would say is it's important to know the dates. There are some very, very important dates in the tax calendar, and it's important to know them, all right? I got, I think, two more. You want to know if you owe taxes. You want to know if you have a tax liability, all right? There are individuals that have not filed taxes for years, but they have W-2s that all that information is sent to the IRS and they have a tax liability. 
there are individuals that have situations such as child support, student loans, um, and then all of a sudden they get hit four or five years down the line with a tax bill. So you that is something that you can also get on the irs.gov website. So what I would say is to each individual that's on this Zoom call tonight, um, go on the irs.gov website, become familiar with it, learn how to pull your tax transcripts. It's your information. Make sure that information is accurate. Any question that you need to know, there's a search bar. You can type a question in on the irs.gov website. And a lot of the questions that a lot of individuals have, you can get that answer right there on the irs.gov website, okay? Um, you gotta know what's going on. You really gotta be up to date. Another thing that I want, the last thing I want to share with you guys, this will be the last one, um, is that there's, 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 a, there's, a tax, there's a tax date. There's a date that's very, very important to every individual. It's like you start over and that's December 31st. The new year starts January 1st. So you want to make sure that um, whether you want to make sure that the amount of money that's taken out your checks is, is right. You want to make sure that you record what's on your, if you own a business, you want to make sure that you track your mileage. You want to make sure that all those things you record December 31st, because January 1st, it starts at zero and you start all over again. April 15th is when taxes is done. Is, is when taxes are due for the in a normal year. But if you have to file an extension, then it becomes October 15th. It's important to know those dates. One piece of advice that I would give to everyone um, is please, please, please do not be that person that does not file. If you're supposed to file your taxes, it's better to file. There's a 5% penalty every day that you do not file. As opposed to you filing and having a balance with the IRS and you can work out either a payment plan or you can set up some type of arrangement with them. But the, the penalties on your paying, on your balance that you owe is 0.1%. So it's one penny per day, whereas for not filing, you, fail, you, you, you face a non-filing fee, and that is 5% every day. And those fees add up. And if I had to choose between paying 5% every day or a penny per day on what I owed, I would definitely take the penny. So don't fear the IRS. Don't fear taxes. And if it's a situation where you don't know what to do or you don't know where to start, you find yourself a licensed and certified tax professional. And the way that you find one that's certified by the IRS is you go on the, on the IRS website, you put your zip code in, and the ones that are certified will pop up. I am honored to say that I am featured on that website. I do have my certification. And I realized that in my zip code per se, I am the only one. So there's a lot of people that do taxes. There's a lot of people that just enter numbers. There's not a lot of people that's certified by the IRS. Make sure you get someone that you can trust. Make sure you get someone that's educated and make sure you have someone that lets you know what's going on and has your best interests at heart. My name is Lystra John. It has been an honor and a pleasure to be with you guys tonight. And I am, I am opening up the floor to any questions that you guys may have. Thank you, Lystra. That was a lot of wealthy information. We certainly appreciate you on tonight. There are a few questions in the chat. Um, the first question is, how can an outdated W-4 -W form affect a person's taxes? Okay, so it's not a matter of it being outdated. It's a matter of it not being updated. And what happens is 
say your scenario changes, whether you got married or at the time that you filled out your W-4, you had four children, but now your children are grown. Your situation has changed and you're actually not either, number one, not getting enough taxes taken out of your check or reverse getting too many too much money taken out of your check. So it's important to know wh what you should be having and I think that an individual should definitely review that on a yearly basis. Okay, two part <laughs> question. What, uh, okay, if they have too much money or not enough money um, being deducted from their paycheck, is there a penalty at the end of the year? It's not a penalty. That's the whole purpose of filing taxes. So if you're getting too many tax, too much money taken out, you get a huge tax refund. However, if you don't get enough money taken out, you're the individual that owes the IRS. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's see if any other questions are there. If no taxes will be owed, do you still have to file for a deceased person? It depends on your, on your filing status. So for instance, if you always file married filing joint or married filing uh, uh, separate and your spouse is, is deceased, the year that they're deceased, you would definitely want to add to that information. Also individuals don't know if you had a child in the year and that child has like say for instance, the, the baby died, you still can put that child on the um, your tax return. Okay, thank you. Um, another question. You was mentioning small business. Uh, if a person have a small business, which do they claim, gas, mileage, or both? You can't claim both. It's one or the other. So there's actual expenses, which will be the gas, um, not per se gas, but um, you want to put your car payments, the tires, any repairs you did on the car, that's actual. Or you can do mileage. It depends on what your car, you know, what year your car is. And which one gets you the most money? I think mileage to me is something that a lot of individuals don't record. And it's 56 cents per mile. So that's like, if you go back and forth, just one mile, that's $1. And if you calculate how many miles you drive for your, your business every year, it's thousands of dollars. And individuals leave that I face this on a daily basis where people do not record their mileage. What about, now I'm a 1099 employee, okay? So what type of um, benefits is that for me? 1099 employees receive the same type of business, um, same type of benefits as a business owner because they get to then now write off a lot of the expenses that they have for whatever that 1099 um, job is. So the miles they get to write off the, the um, for instance, if a person is an Uber driver, they get to write off um, all of their expenses that's associated with that 1099 position. What about the office and the home? How does that? As a business owner, as a 1099, you get to write that off. As a person, so we had a situation per se where a lot of people worked from home last year due to COVID. However, they don't get to write off those expenses if they for their job. However, if they have a business, they do. Okay. All right. And there's a question. What records are important to keep? Wow, that is a great great question so first thing you need to keep is first of all have a copy of your social security card there are individuals that write their numbers down and they um and they they transpose the numbers um so it's important you know a lot of people don't like to share that information but it's not only to have that information for you but it's also good to have that for your dependents I know me, if I have four children, I have a set of twins, I do not know my kid's social security number by heart. So it's important to keep social security numbers. It's important to keep W-2s. 
it's definitely important to keep record of mileage. If you're a homeowner, you want to keep your 10, anything that comes that says tax form 1098, 1099, um, any forms you get in them. There's a lot of people that you guys, you know, you hear all this talk about um, Bitcoin and Dogecoin and Robinhood and Coinbase. They send forms at the end of the year. Also, individuals that get stock, um, that do um, savings bonds, anything that, or, um, if you have money in the savings account, you'll get a, 10, uh, a 1098 INT or 1099 INT, it's important to have keep the, all of those records. IRS rules is you should keep your records for seven years. Now I want to revisit back. There's a two part question um, going back to um, the deceased person filing for the deceased person. Um, yes. The deceased was eight or seven, no husband and always filed as a single individual. But the first part of the question was, if no taxes will be owed, do you still have to file for a deceased person who was eight or seven, no husband, husband, and always file as a single individual? Only if the, if they have no taxes owed, then it serves no purpose. Okay. But if they and and the only person in that case that can file for them is someone that has power of attorney or um, owns the estate. Okay. And um, Carmen Ham was raised. I can't hear you. I can't hear you, Carmen. There you go. Nope. 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 We can't hear you. There you go. Okay, so here's my question. As a franchise owner, um, and the vehicles that I have, they were my personal vehicles. Should I put any new vehicles in the company name? As a franchise owner, okay. Whether it's in the company's name or not, the question that's going to be asked is, is the car used for business purposes or personal use? If it's used for just business alone, you can just, that car, all the expenses are for business. So it all de depends on what you use the car for. It doesn't matter whose name it is, it's in. Okay. Um, then I was misinformed. So I'm glad I asked the question. And the reason again, is because the one vehicle I primarily use as a business vehicle, even though I'm the business owner, but I, I'm also a realtor and um, I do schedule K. So that's why I was asking. I think it's now you, so you could also use the car for depreciation. Okay. So it all depends on your, like I said, taxes are like fingerprints. Everybody's yeah. situation is different. It all depends on what your particular situation is. And in your case, I would say that you can definitely put it down as depreciation. Depreciation, now that you brought that up, is something that a lot of people don't realize that, um, and, we, and, and a lot of us don't take to our advantage. I'll give you guys a scenario. Last year, we dealt with quarantine and shutdown. And in the first year that you own your business, you're allowed to write off um, all startup costs the first year in business. So just imagine someone that was excited about 2020 started, decided they wanted to open up a restaurant, spent 20,000, 25,000 to get this business started. February, they're getting ready to do their grand opening in March, they get shut down. And they're shut down for the whole year. They are allowed to take the first, they're allowed to put $5,000 on their tax return as a loss, and they're allowed to write off the balance of it. So that's $20,000 for 18, for, um, for five years. So, and a lot of people don't do this. So even though you took a loss, you might not be able to take all of it in the first year, but imagine next year being able to take some advantage of it. And the year after, and the year after that, and then you'll be able to at least be able to depreciate that over a, a, a length of time. Thank you. And another question is on the table. How could a person's income show a difference of $10,000?
i.e. 47,000 in 2019 and in 2020, 57,000. They made more money. <laughs> they either received a raise, they either worked more hours, um, they got a bonus. There could be so many situations in where there, there's a $10,000 increase in income. They're not, you know, they could change their, um, for instance, maybe um, in one year they were getting um, their health insurance and all of that taken out. And then the next year they decided to change that. So it all depends on the different scenario. I have a question. Yes. I'm the lady that that question came from. Yes. <laughs> and none of that happened to me. I don't have any recollection of a uh, of bonus as such. <laughs> um, so I'm just baffled uh, by that. That's why I was asking the question. I put it on the table because um, uh, I don't understand it. So of course I'm going to human resources about it. Yeah, that, that, that would be the first question to find and get a breakdown, like what, mm -hmm. what makes up that, um, that, that income? Where do they get those numbers from? Right, I'm Terrell, by the way, um, Lustra, thank you. No problem. I will do that. There's another question. Are there any minimum income profit or expenses, et cetera, you have to reach to file taxes as a business or freelancer? Anything over $600 must be filed. And, and can I share something? A lot of people don't understand or don't quite understand what's the difference between a business and a hobby. And um, there's a lot of people that have businesses that don't file their taxes because they think, oh, I didn't make any money, so I don't think I should file it. IRS rules say that once you have, once you have the intent to create a profit, you own a business. And once you operate it more than two hours per week or more than an hour per day, it is a business and no longer a hobby. That's good to know. That is good to know. Are there any more questions? I'm sorry, Ms. Brown. Did, did you repeat that, uh, Lustra? The, you said that once you have the intent? The intent, mm -hmm. yes. And to create a profit. Profit, uh-huh. And also, once you put more than one hour per day mm -hmm. into your business, okay. or two hours per week, okay. It is no longer a hobby. It is now a business. All three must, mm -hmm. I would say all three, but you have to have the intent to, so it can't be just for fun, basically. Right, thank you. That is very good information. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put um, Lystra's contact information in the chat. And if you have additional questions, you can email her and um, to get some further clarification or if other questions come up. I also okay. offer um, I offer consultation to individuals. It's free, 15 minutes. Um, I can definitely provide my information to the ladies. They can share it to get on my calendar. Um, like I said, taxes is my passion and my people suffer, our people suffer because of lack of knowledge. There's no reason to be scared of the IRS. Um, they say that the person who knows tax law wins. And we see that. We saw that last year with the president that we have. He knew the tax law. He, he won off of it. Once you know tax law, you win. And it's nothing to be scared of. So true. And I am, Mar yes, Margie. I am Margie McLean's tax preparer. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Lystra, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, thank you, you. thank you. you. Thank yeah, you. this was awesome. This was amazing. I learned so much tonight my, myself and I'm, this was just awesome, wealth of information. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Carmen Palmer and she's going to talk to us about additional finances that will be useful in our lives. Carmen. Thank you. Thank you ladies so much for having me as one of your presenters tonight. It is an honor to be here. Um, I'm going to set my alarm because I don't want to go over. I'm a talker. I'm an evangelist, so I can talk all day and all night. It's like 
in a boxing ring with Mike Tyson. So I am um, 47 years old. And at the age of 23, my husband and I started flipping homes. We were able to go to the bank and it was no problem for Bank of America to issue us a $36,000 check. Um, so we had no inkling of how great our credit was until something happened in our life that challenged our credit. And so um, a lot of what I know about credit is due to me being a realtor, number one, and then also walking down that path. Um, my great grandmother, Nanny Martin out of Eden, North Carolina, she used to say that <clears throat> the only good thing you have is your name. And I didn't understand that until I was probably 30 or 27, 30 years old. And then I understood if you have credit and most, and, and Lystra can probably attest to this, most wealthy people do not use credit. They'll pay cash for things. So then there's that small portion of our community that will go to somewhere like a renter center or um, a place where they will not pull your credit a lot to get to establish credit. And one thing that we've taught our three children was to, um, in, in credit, you don't need a credit card your freshman year of college. So you don't need to have, you don't need to incur a lot of debt. And you wanna make sure that you keep your credit file spotless and you do not have to pay these people. There are signs all over, I'm in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. So there are signs all over the city, you know, free credit repair, we can help you for a minimal investment. Um, I actually did that by default years ago. I think I was probably 27 at the time. And then I said, nope, I understood the credit laws, the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And I knew what to do because again, in my profession, I see people all the time that want to purchase a house, but they do not have that 640 credit score. And in order to purchase a home, you need a 640 credit score. Although FHA says you only need a 585. The mortgage companies put an overlay as a protector over top of what FHA says that is governed by the government. So FHA says you only need a 585, but your mortgage company is saying you need a 640. Some, I do have a company that will take it at a 585, but let's see neither here nor there. So you want to know what's on your credit report. You wanna make sure, you know, back in the day, um, <clears throat> I'm not saying me, but I had cousins that used their children's social security number. Um, I made sure that when I had children that my children's social security number was put up and as a matter of fact, it's still in the bedroom top drawer. They had to know their own social security number or they had to keep their card once they became responsible. But you wanna make sure that you check your credit report every year. And there's, you can get your credit report free at annualcreditreport.com. That's annualcreditreport.com or, and I had to write it down, um, or you can call 1-877-322-8228. And you are entitled to get your credit report once a year for free. And there are three credit reporting agencies. Um, we have Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. And we talked about the FICO. You, 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 we also have something called FICO. That is your credit score. The lower your credit score is, the higher your interest is going to be on a car, or on a, a mortgage loan. And so when we talk about credit, we wanna make sure that we keep our credit polished. You know, all of us ladies, we like nail polish. This is, you can hardly see it. My, um, my cousin is my nail tech. And so she talked me into this little pink color. I like a red color like Sister Terry has on. I love red nails. So when you talk about your credit, you wanna make sure that you keep your credit polished, you, is that it's clean. So here's one thing that you need to do. You need to look at your credit report. If you see something on your credit report, especially a medical bill or um, anything medical, you want to establish a plan. Once you know what your credit score is and you look at it and you say, hey, that's not mine. Um, for instance, my husband had, there's another gentleman in Forsyth County with the same name as my husband, although he's Caucasian. And my husband, of course, is black. Um, and we found out because we started getting phone calls all of a sudden, and that's why we went to no landline. Um, they were calling the house asking for this Mr. Palmer and I'm going, no, my husband doesn't have that credit card. I know what credit cards that man has <laughs> because every once in a while I might use it. But anyway, 
you want to make sure that there's nothing negative reporting on your credit report. If it is, you have the right to dispute that. But let me tell you, when you dispute it, and this is critical, so take a note here. If you dispute something on your credit report, make sure it's not about to fall off because they keep things on your credit report for seven years. Call it the seven year itch or, or the bad seven years. So if something is gonna fall off, we're in April now, May of 2021, you do not want to go and dispute that. And the reason why is because it will start your seven years all over. But if you need to dispute something, I suggest that you do it in writing. Number one, because everybody has internet. Back in the day, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna tell you this, this story right here. I was able to wipe $36,000 off of our credit report because it was reported inaccurately. Now, had I disputed it online as the way these companies are doing and that they're charging you for, it would have stayed there. But I had a, I re, I wrote a letter out, I had my receipts. So Lister, you'd be proud of me, I had my receipts. And you know, in our culture, we call receipts on everything. So I had my receipts and I showed where that debt was already paid off. And so because I sent it in the mail, it was over the 30 day period of time that they had to respond back. Well, by the time they responded back, they couldn't find the file because they didn't have records of it. So that file was able to be deleted off of my credit report. We're talking about $36,000. And I'm not talking about something where you go and buy this miracle water. I'm talking about, I sat down and I typed up the letter, put it in the mail with the receipts of where the debt had already been paid off years ago, but it was reported inaccurately. And so from there, I said, okay, let me start educating my people, especially in my profession. Do not pay somebody $50 a month to wipe something off your credit. When you can save that money, put it in your pocket and do it yourself. You want to create a, a letter to dispute your debt if it's inaccurate. Now, if you owe it, you owe it, go ahead and pay it. But if you have to pay it, you want to get a negotiation on it. You want a 50% settlement. So if you owe a, back in the day, I think when cell phones came out in the late nineties, when I was in high school, probably before then. So I graduated high school in 92. So you get a cell phone and back then, cell phones, they were reporting if you were late or anything like that. You could dispute that if you had a cell phone bill that you knew was inaccurate, you could dispute that cell phone bill with a settlement. So if the cell phone bill was, they said you, say Verizon said you owe $1,400, you call them up and say, you know what? I do not have that $1,400, but what I do have is $700. Will you take a 50% off settlement? If they say yes, you ask them to send you that settlement in writing. You want everything in writing and then do not send a check into them until you get that letter in your hand. Once you get that letter in your hand, you send the check, make copies of everything, keep it for your records and send it back to them. And then in that same letter, you want to ask them to remove that negative entry off of your credit file. Because if it's not removed off, it's just gonna to continue to stay negative for another, another seven years. So then what you do is once it's removed off, you ask them to update your credit report to show a zero balance, a zero dollar balance, okay? Again, this is critical, especially when you're getting ready to purchase a car or a home from me. Don't go, nobody, don't go anywhere else, <laughs> that's a shameless plug. But when you get ready to purchase a car, we want to know what's on there. My husband in 2018 went to purchase a brand new Silverado. And it was ironic that the salesman, which was another African-American, he leaned over and he asked my husband, he said, how's your credit? And my husband was like, I don't have an issue with my credit. You can run my credit. He said, well, I have to ask because a lot of people come in here and they don't want us to run their credit because they have all these things on there. Again, you'll get a higher interest rate with if your credit score is you know, in the 400s and, and 500s. So you want to dispute that at annualcreditreport.com. You want to write a letter to those credit bureaus once you dispute it. If you're going to do a settlement, do it for 50%, 50 cents. Just think 50 cents on every dollar. That's going to save you money. That's more money that you can save to put up for, for whatever you're looking for, okay? Know your dates. So I'm trying to keep my notes here. Know your dates. Do not dispute it if it's about to fall off. It stays on your credit report for seven years. And for the love of, 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 for the love of love, 
do not go out and have a lot of hard inquiries on your credit. So you, um, there is in, during college time, at the beginning of the college, they will have a lot of different banks, Wells Fargo, Bank of America come out. Oh, we'll give you a two liter soda if you apply for our credit card. Guess what? You don't need a two liter soda that you can buy for 99 cents. It's gonna pull your credit down by 25 to 60 some points. And the more they pull your credits, that's a hard inquiry. You do not need those hard hits because they will show up. And a soft inquiry is okay. So for in my world, when a, per a person is purchasing a home, they can bounce from lender to lender within a 45 period day of time. And that would be considered a soft pull. But before they bounce to a new lender, I always tell them, if you know your credit score, tell that new lender what your credit score is. Let them determine because there's there's funds that you could get for purchasing a home. That's a whole nother lesson. But you want to make sure that you settle for 50% or less on your debt. Make sure they send you a letter that says that they will agree to that settlement and that they will update your credit file to report a zero balance effective the date that they receive your money. And if you want to, you can actually, if you don't want to send a check, I always say send a check or money order. You want a paper trail. You want to be able to have a paper trail, okay? So do that, um, but get everything in writing. Know your date, um, the dates that they're on there. Medical right now does not hurt as bad as it used to, but student loans now count as 1% of your debt to income ratio. So you need to know, again, if you're gonna purchase a house, what your debt to income ratio is. If you're not gonna purchase a house, don't, don't worry about that. But you do need to know if that old Annie Penn Hospital bill is gonna fall off next month or if it's gonna stay on there and ask them to negotiate. If they say, we don't have any record of it, well then who has my record? You ask them that. And then if they keep giving you, so for instance, some, um, some companies, there's a company out of Greensboro on Elm Eugene Street, not Elm Eugene, Smith Street, downtown uh, Greensboro. They are a debt collector. So they may have something from one medical office. And then once they get your name and address off of one, they're going to almost put in like a search party. They put an APB out on you. So you want to make sure that your information is accurate and that it doesn't go to someone else's house because you don't want your nosy neighbor picking up your bills or, or a threatening letter. Now, you can also tell them, <coughs> excuse me, why you are repairing your credit. You can say, you know what? I did not receive that bill from you. Would you be so kind as to mail me a copy? Do not email me. Don't give them your email. No, not right away because they will blow that email up. Ask them to mail you a copy of that. And before you answer any debt collector, do not give them your personal information. If a debt collector is calling you to, um, to about a bill you owe and they ask you your name, tell them you called me. So you tell me what is my name. If they say, well, we need to verify your social security number. Do not give anyone your social security number because they can use that social security number and run up debt in your name. You do not, you, that's why it's important to go to annualcreditreport.com to know what's on there, but you wanna, you wanna pull your credit report once a year to make sure that it's accurate. And, and it's, it's absolutely free, it's absolutely free. So you don't have to pay for it. Back in the days, I used to live in Atlanta and you would have to pay Experian to pull your credit file. Um, and once you have started disputing things, you will notice that there is a pattern. If one thing comes off, it's almost like a domino effect. The other things come off, but you have to make sure that your dispute letter is accurate and that it says the same thing. You know what, I do not owe this bill or I owe this bill, but I'm only willing to give you 50% 50, 50 of what the balance is. Do not negotiate any higher than that. Don't say, oh, I'll give you 75% because you don't wanna you know, deal with them because Jeopardy is coming on and you wanna watch Jeopardy, no. 50% 50, 50 of the balance, that's what's on there and make sure that you have it in writing. Any questions so far? I'm going to take a sip of water.
Okay. Once you um, know what your credit report says and you dispute it again, dispute by mail first, then dispute online. If you need to put a writer on your credit file, make sure that it's something accurate. Don't, you know, just say, or you do not want to put a freeze on there either. Don't put a freeze on your credit because that could, that could harm you in the long run. So don't do that. But to the first thing you need to do to clear your credit up is to go ahead and get that credit file and then dispute it by mail before you do online disputing. And do not pay these companies to do what you can do for free. Save that money. That's all I have, Lady Brown. That was a lot. And that was very, very helpful because in our Black community, a lot of times we run into situations where credit is an issue and it keeps us from getting properties and cars and, you know, things that we really need. So that was very good information that we can definitely live by and share this information. Please, please, please share the information that you received tonight. Share with your children and your grandchildren because financial literacy is, um, it's like a heritage that we can leave our children instead of leaving our children with debt, leave them with something that, that can they can use in their future and just share. Sometimes we need to sit down and have conversations, have that round table, go in that kitchen, have conversations about credit and paying taxes and calling your credits. I tell my kids all the time, do not be afraid to call your creditors. They want the money. You know, they're not asking, you know, I used to be a collector and I know how hard it is for people to want to talk to you, but they are in this environment, in this climate of COVID, they're a little lenient. So this is almost like the best time to call to make payment arrangements. And like she was saying about taxes, I had a tax issue and someone wanted to charge me $2,500. My uh, tax preparer was like, it was X amount of dollars per hour. And when I calculated that, it was like $2,500 because she was calculating the time that would take for her to stay on hold at the IRS. But I said, bless God, I'm at home. I can call myself. And that's what I did. I put the phone on mute and I washed dishes, cooked dinner, did everything else. And I kept my little journal. And we, that's another thing. When you call these creditors, write a journal who you're speaking with and, and make sure you get their ID number. If they have, a lot of times they don't want to give you the last name, but they would definitely give you their ID number. But when you, but back to the RS, do not pay anybody to do what you can do for yourself. I want to amen that because I made arrangements for myself and I kept $2,500 plus in my own pocket. If you got $2,500 to pay somebody to make phone calls for you, you can use that money to pay your bills. So we have definitely had a lot of good information. So let's see, we have some questions. We have some questions, let's see. Let me scroll up here. Okay, this is a great question. Do you advocate using CCCS, Consumer Credit Counseling Service, if a person is overwhelmed with credit card bills? Um, so the only time I use them is when they are purchasing a house. So I, I mean, I want to keep them employed because that's their job. But a lot of times what they're gonna do is tell you basically what you can Google online these days. It's, Oh, and I forgot to say that, so I'm glad this question came up. Keep your credit card minimum, your balance um, at 10% of your high balance. So I'm not a math person. So let me let Lystra give, give me an example of, you know, well, I'm sorry, 25%. So if it's, um, <laughs> I, I'm not gonna mess y'all up. So if it's $1,000, you wanna make sure that your credit card balance is down below 750, okay? And the reason why, again, that's going to keep your credit score, you want to have a revolving credit score. And um, I forgot to mention one other thing. I just saw it in my notes of notes here. Credit karma is, is okay, but it does not give you the accurate. That's just like Zillow doesn't give you the accurate on what, what the value is. So credit karma is okay. But if you need to establish credit after you've already paid your credit off, um, 
I would suggest getting a secured card through your bank or a Discover card or Capital One. I was gonna say Capital Hill, but it's Capital One. <laughs> so Capital One or um, it used to be JCPenney, but again, you don't want high interest rates. You, the, the goal is to keep you out of credit debt and those blemishes off your credit report. So once you do have your credit restored, you can go back and get a, a smaller credit card. I, the secured card is better. And the reason why, because you can do that through your bank and you can put the money in as in your savings account, you know, a $500 limit. And then you want to make sure that they report to all three credit bureaus. That's the number one thing. So once you start disputing, make sure that all three bureaus are updated. Because sometimes they don't, don't coincide. So you want to make sure that they do that, okay? Awesome, awesome. Listra, did you have a question? Woo, I don't have a question. I'm excited. Um, Margie <laughs> will be able to tell you guys that I actually... Um, I own a credit repair business. Well, I used to own a credit repair business. And what I realized, I own, I started my credit repair business because I was one of those individuals that was just scared of my credit score. It, it was horrible. I was the person that wanted the, it's at Macy's when they said, you get 10% off if you apply. And, um, and then I'll do it in Victoria's Secret. And then I'll do it in every store that I went into. And then I had all these cards. And then, of course, when I was in college, they give you a free pocketbook or a free handbag or a folder. If you And I had all these credit cards. And I no one educated me about credit. So I thought when they gave me $5,000 that I had $5,000. I didn't know anything about only use 20% or 30% because that's not conversations that were held in our community. Last year, I decided that I didn't want to do credit repair anymore. I wanted to do credit education. So I love, love, love this topic. It's just second in line next to taxes. But what I wanted to share is one thing that hurts um, credit, I would say the most, is late payments. Late payments hurts you more than anything. So... Um, I, I give a scenario usually when I do my, my um, and I'm sorry to, to jump into credit, but I just figured it was an open forum. Let me share. Um, say you have a situation where you have a credit card bill that's due, you have Duke Energy that's due, and you have rent that's due. And you're like, I don't know which one should I pay first. Everybody knows Duke Energy is going to take a payment arrangement. So if I had to choose between paying my Duke Energy bill or paying my credit card bill, I would pay my credit card bill or I will contact the creditor and I will let them know, listen, I'm dealing with something. Is it okay that I change the date? It's important to communicate with your creditors because that late payment, mm -hmm. is, especially Carmen could tell you what purchasing mm -hmm. a home. I just purchased a home last year. Little things like that, like sting. It's like a bee sting. It's like, oh my gosh, I paid one bill late and it, it can't come off your credit report. So the best thing to do is avoid it. Now, um, I'm going to stray a little bit just because this is financial literacy. And I do see that I see a lot of mamas on the, on the, um, on the Zoom because I zoomed out so I could see everybody's face. Um, I also work for Amazon. And, I, and, I, and I'm one of those people, if you guys, you go through your phone and you just get all these spam unlikely calls. Don't let those people call you and scare you. Even creditors. Mm -hmm. Don't let them call you and scare you. They will tell you that you owe some things. First of all, the IRS is not going to call you. So anyone that calls and tell you that they're the IRS is a scam. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyone that calls and tell you that um, they're coming to, they come to your house to get, or they need you to go to Walmart and buy a gift card or anyone that says they need you to log on to your computer or log on through your smartphone, that's all scams. And the reason why they do it is because it's identity theft. And it became very, very rampant during last year. Um, there's a lot of elderly people. There's a lot of people that don't work, that don't need to file taxes, that now they're getting these things in the mail called 1099Gs. And they're wondering, why am I getting a 1099G? Well, all these scam calls are using individuals' information and filing unemployment on other people's names. 
So you guys want to be very careful of who has your information. Guard it like how you would guard anything else. If they call and they say they, they want something from you, if they can't send it in mail in, in the mail, then you can't discuss it. So I just wanted to add a piggyback on what Carmen was saying. Um, this is a conversation that I get real, real, real excited about. Uh, can I uh, real quick on that? Um, I'm a witness to that. I received an email um, stating that I had, um, I guess, ordered something for my computer and uh, the, 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 um, it was getting ready to be taken off of my um, credit card because the year uh, had came up and it was like $500. And I'm like, I don't remember doing anything like that, especially not for $500. So I started looking through the emails because it was a, a mass email. I started looking through the emails and I saw um, some of the people say, you know, if you charge my credit card, I'm gonna call, um, I'm gonna call, uh, you know, theft or what so have you, fraud. So I did the same thing. And when I did that, then they deleted. it. You couldn't even delete me off the email. So I called the number just to see what it was. And they was, they said the same thing. I need you to log onto your computer or whatever. I said, well, I'm not here. I'm not, you know, well, I need you to log on. I said, sir, I am not at my computer. I am, you know, and they kept, I said, can you understand? So I just went on and hung up. So I was like, this has to be a scam. So when I hung up, they kept calling and calling and calling. And I'm like, this, this don't seem, you know, logical. So I was like, okay, call me tomorrow in the morning. So finally they called. I didn't answer, but they just kept calling and calling. I said, okay, something ain't right. So I'm just not going to answer the phone anymore. And I blocked them. So I figured that was some type of scam to get my information because now you want me to log on. And every time I, I just told you I was not at my computer, it was almost like they didn't hear nothing I said. They just wanted me to log on somehow. And then when I tried to go to the website just to look them up, it just looked like a scam website. So I just figured, yeah, this this, this is nothing. So um, I'm glad you uh, mentioned that as well, so. What they do is they log into you, they have you log into your computer or your smartphone and they basically wipe off everything off and they have it in their system and mm -hmm. they're able to get mm -hmm. access to your name and your mm -hmm. this and all your personal information. And they're able to do lots of things, whether use your credit or use your identity mm -hmm. to do fraudulent things with. So it's very important that you protect those things. Um, anything that, that sounds too good to be true, it's just not mm -hmm. worth it. Um, I know at my job, I, I deal with it every day. I have somebody say, Amazon just called and said that um, somebody tried to buy a $500 iPhone and they need me to log on to my phone, to my computer. But, and then in order for them to log into my computer, they need me to buy a gift card from Walmart yeah. for $50. And these people yeah. are running to Walgreens and Walmart buying these gift cards because they scared somebody scamming them when they're actually on the phone with the scammer. Mm. Yeah. That's what happened to me last December. I was one of the ones that was involved with the, um, what is it? Uh, iPad, Apple, the Apple scam. I was one of those people. So yes, what you're saying is absolutely correct. Carmen, thank you so much for all that vital information. Again, we just thank you across virtual lines. We're clapping. We we'll appreciate you ladies for giving us. One little thing. Okay. Like Lister said, keeping the notes. So I have a folder from 2003 where I disputed those claims and they came off. So if they ever pop back up, I have the folder, it's a yellow folder that I just pull out with the note in there that said that those should have been on there. So keep your documents, keep your records. Do you have a length of time, how long we should keep our documents? I, well, because in my field, I keep everything for three years. Okay, three, okay. Yeah, you can keep it longer than that if you have the capacity, but what you can do is scan those documents and put uh -huh. them on a hard drive. Right, that's the thing. Pro same thing with taxes, Lystra, scan, Document. Yes, yes. You don't have to have the physical. You just want to be able to access it. So it can be scanned. How many Especially years of records should we keep? Seven years. Seven years. And even with credit, I say seven years because um, what happens, a lot of these companies, they sell your, you know, um, say you owe Verizon or a hospital bill. After 90 days, you done another company bought it. 
and then another company buys it, and then another company buys it. The problem is the third, fourth, second company, they have no way of proving the initial charge. And there's a pro there's what we call in the credit world, you need to va verify, but you also need to validate a debt. And mm -hmm. if you're not able to validate a debt, then it's not accurate. And a lot of the companies don't have the information. So when you tell them to validate this information and they can't, then it's inaccurate. And by law, it needs to drop off all three credit bureaus. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, ladies, I have placed um, Carmen's contact information and her uh, bio, her picture and contact information is up on the screen. Lystra John's information is also in the chat. So as questions come up or if you need to call consultation, reach out and talk to them. Um, we have had a lot of information tonight. So some things you may not retain, but you know, mm -hmm. I'm sure they'll be welcome to any of your questions. Thank you all for attending. I'm gonna turn it over to our president, Marjorie McLean, that she can give us closing remarks and end us out. Thank you, Margie. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, thank you, Gail, for hosting this. She's new. She just joined, like, I think last month and two months ago, and she, she jumped right on. She was here two months, okay. Uh, two months ago, and she jumped right in. Um, if I can, uh, if the host don't mind, I, I, there is two more questions since we have time, if I can ask those two questions that's in there. Um, one question I wanted to ask personally for myself is um, once you, okay, for instance, I um, got in a, a car accident uh, two years ago, a really bad car accident, and the car was totaled, of course, uh, right before I was going to, um, before I was going to add gap, so I forgot to do the gap, didn't get a chance to, so of course, the remainder is what I owe. Um, recently, I just let it sit there. I didn't mess with it. I didn't talk to anyone. I let it sit there. And then recently, I received a letter that stated um, out of the $8,000 I owe they gave me a settlement for like $1,400. Of course, I jumped on it. Um, my question is if you settle a debt, um, if you um, settle a debt, can the debt, um, the creditor, sell the rest of your debt to another debt? Um, collection agency. Can I answer that? All right, so first of all, you wanna make sure that the person that you're settling it with is the person that owns the debt because okay. there are a lot, you can actually go online right now and buy debt pennies on the dollar and you don't wanna pay them whether it's half or a quarter or whatever, and it doesn't affect your score. So what you want to make sure that you do, first of all, they need to validate that you owe that charge. So they need to prove it. You ask them, can you please send me some information in reference to this charge? So you want to make sure that it's going to the right, that they have the right information. Also, you want a debt to settlement letter. So like Carmen says, um, if I pay this debt, is this going to come off all off of my credit report? And if you can't guarantee that, then I, because it makes no sense to pay it if it's not going to affect your credit mm -hmm. and then it's still there. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that you're paying a legitimate company and that it is indeed that they're making a, it's called a promise to pay, you know, debt settlement letter, any of those, make sure that they're actually going to take it off. Okay. And if they're not, then don't pay it. Okay. That's just how, you know, that would be my advice. Thank you. And do and not next, give them any okay. personal information as far as credit card information. Right. Okay. That validation. So, okay. Because here's the thing I hate to say it, but sometimes um, if you, uh, you'll have a call from someone that may be overseas. Right. You, you want to make sure that they are someone, you know, that is legitimate before you say, oh, here's my credit card and I'm pay it off. Well, you don't want to pay off a debt with a credit card anyway. So. Yeah, normally I tell them I'll just send the payment in and they ask for, um, you know, like your, either your bank information or your debit card. I said, no, I'll send a check or what's up. Um, the other question is, do late payments fall off after seven years? They do. Okay. They do. Okay. All right. And also, I used to be a skip tracer um, back in the day. Y'all probably don't remember this. Oh, yes, I, I do. I do. So I was the credit manager um, and we would do skip traces on people. 
and we would go to that little machine, type in their name, and it'll tell us their latest addresses and everything. And, you know, we would start calling relatives. You know, when you do a credit application, they ask you for next of kin and whatnot. So if you're going to put somebody's name down, make sure they know you're putting it down. But, you know, pay the bill first, so. All right. There's two sets of information that's very important in the home buying process. Very, very, very. Make sure that your credit is right and make sure that your taxes is right. Those two pieces of information makes it very easy to purchase a home. Lister, I can't wait to talk to you offline. <laughs> I'm ready for you, Carmen. Let's do it. <laughs> President Car Margie? I'm here. Okay, it's all on you. Close this okay. out. All right, so one, I'd like to thank you again for coming. I appreciate it. Can y'all hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'd like to thank you for coming. I really appreciate all the information that was received. It was helpful for me. Um, I would like to thank again our um, host. If y'all can give her a hand virtually. Thank you. Lisa, thank you so much. You, this is your second time with us on our um, financial um, web uh, literacy week. You came to our first one. We had it in Burlington. It was awesome. That's really how I, I think I kind of met you. I can't remember exactly. I think it was on Facebook or through someone. Miss um, Palmer, Miss um, Palmer, thank you so much for the information. Um, I definitely will be contacting you as well. Um, I know we have a few members that's hey. on um, the call. So yeah, let me call first, you back. I'm listening to a, um, uh -oh. a financial workshop on Zoom. Okay. Uh -huh. So. Um, before we uh, get started, uh, before we leave, I would like, I think my our state president, Ms. Queen DeGraffery is on, if she would like to have some, some words. Oh, I don't know what to say. This has been great. We got to make sure that our collegiates and our young members get on for the rest of this week, Margie. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to send out an email to the chair, third vice president tonight to send out to all those young folks because they need this information up front, not when you get in trouble. Right. And, uh, <laughs> and so I'm going to send that out so she can contact all of them. Uh, also, I want to recognize and thank two of our other section representatives. We have the first vice president of Metro Greensboro, uh, Ms. Maxine Terry is representing that section, and we're glad she's on. We have Sandra, uh, Sandra Crop, the president of the Durham section on as well. And we don't, this is not just uh, Alamance Guilt County thing. This is a North Carolina thing. Matter of fact, it's a United States thing. Yeah. <laughs> but we really <laughs> want to make sure that our members in North Carolina and our associates get this information. Uh, I'm an old program planner, so I can look at how much work and time had to have gone in to putting this together for a week. Mm -hmm. So as state president, part of my responsibility is going to be is making sure that people benefit from it. This is one of our national uh, thrusts. Economic empowerment is yes. one of National Council of Negro Women's thrusts. And Margie hit it on the, on the head. This is where it starts. This is where it starts. We don't have to be spenders all of our lives. We can be investors and we can think strategically and get things done and be financially solvent. You can be poor and financially solvent. You can be middle income financially solvent. 
You can be rich and financially solid. And we need our young people to understand that. But thanks so much. I'm going to try to get more of our people around the state on tomorrow night. And on behalf of the National Council of Negro Women, and that includes our national office, I want to thank the Alamance Gilbert section, its members, and the presenters who were excellent for this great uh, webinar tonight. Margie, back to you. Thank you. Thank you again. If you are interested in um, joining NCNW, National Council of Negro Women, we do have a section in the Greensboro Alamance um, High Point area. We also, again, we have two sections, actually. One is Metro um, Policy in Greensboro, and we are the Alamance Gifford uh, County, which we uh, represents the county um, line and also High Point. Uh, as well as some other areas as well. If you're interested, you can email me at alamancegilfordncnw at gmail.com. If you're not in the Guilford County um, area or Greensboro area, we do have other sections. Um, you can also email me so you can find where those sections are um, that you would like to join. Um, and it would be great to have you and come on board with us. Uh, the work is needed in the community and we need um, people like you to come in and work with us. Um, we are also starting a youth section as well for young ladies 12 through 18, and but uh, young men can also join as well. And men can also join our sections as well. Um, one of our the things that our national membership chair said, uh, Mr. Glenn, is if you get the men in, you will get the women. So we want the men to come in and support us as well. So I thank everyone from joining. Tomorrow we'll have Miss Tasha Drummond. I don't know if she's on. Uh, I think saw her on. We'll have her on as well. She will be um, speaking um, to our youth and our collegiate area um, younger. Um, members of our community as well as their parents to talk to them about credit and how they can save their credit. I think Ms. Palmer um, uh, either Leisha touched on it about um, us getting those credit cards because I was one. I just signed up just to sign so I can get a free shirt and then all of a sudden I got all these credit cards. Um, at one time I had about 50 different credit cards and I was just charging, charging. And then one day I just paid them off and end up having a real um, funeral for them all. I mean, an actual funeral dressed in black, cut the card, crying, all that good stuff. So she will be <laughs> on tomorrow to talk to us about um, that. Um, the other um, days, Wednesday, we will have Miss Tara Morgan. She will be on to talk to us about investing and stocks. So how do we do stocks? The next day, we will have Miss Chandra Park. She will be um, speaking to us about, I think tomorrow, yes, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, excuse me, she'll be talking about um, how to effectively budget. And then on um, Friday, we will have small businesses. We'll have Miss Anissa Short and Miss um, Ballard. She will be coming on and both of them will be talking to us about small businesses. One, what's the benefit of a small business? And then uh, also how do we fund those small businesses? So again, I hope you come back tomorrow. It's the same link. Please join us and thank you so much from from coming for coming. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you all. Stay safe. Stay well.